So we're going to go by alphabetical order. And our first reader is Kamiko Han, who is a legend in both Asian American and non-Asian American poetry circles. Um, I was actually reading a book that we published, um, this yellow book on the top, uh, Quiet Fire, which is a really amazing historical anthology of uh, Asian American poetry, including plantation poems, poems written at Angel Island, uh, poems written by Walt Women's secretary, who is Japanese American. Uh, and there's actually a part of the back that's a, that's a like testimonial from Kamiko about being kind of here back in the day at the formation of a lot of Asian American art spaces in New York like this one. Um, so Kamiko's written, I think, 11 collections of poetry, um, including The Narrow Road to the Interior, uh, Toxic Flora, which won our literary award, uh, Brain Fever, which is for sale at the back, and parts of which were published in uh, our magazine, The Margins. Uh, and she's received pretty much every award, um, including the Guggenheim, the NEA, uh, the NIFA, uh, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. Um, she's a distinguished professor at the English Department at Queens College CUNY, and is, this year is the president of the board of the Poetry Society of America. Um, let's give a hand to Kamika. Since there are not a lot of writers here, ha, um, I'm going to just comment uh, for a moment on um, this little sequence. I made up an assignment for myself, um, seven lines, six, of, six end stopped. Each, line, each little section had to have a repeating line, and it vaguely had to do with um, each little section had to do with um, Grimm's fairy tale, a, a vague reference to Grimm's fairy tale. Oh. Charming lines, one. As she twirls around, her skirt twirls up. She's lifting her pink flannel, pink flannel skirt. The black river snakes through the blue forest. He drops the orange stones on the gray path. Thank you, Moon. Although every story is about severing cords, the bread, the furnace, we walk home with pockets full of frightful gold. Two. The house overlooks a bitter garden, so dark green it is black. A mother spills milk on the blue tile. 
the white rivulet streams out of the kitchen door over everything but the neighbor's alive greens. Elbows confess to splinters from the windowsill. The daughter's yellow hair will become a golden ladder. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. Three. The girl adores her pink dog. Her mother adores her and her own mother. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. She may not bring her dog to her grandmother, whose fever is in a rush. The long pink path collapses. The red cloak, the basket, the jagged teeth, the hot smell as if grandmother left the iron on. For her nails are white and pink. A sunrise is white and pink. The tree behind the mill bears cherries. Sometimes the fruit is so familiar, even the jays do not pluck any. Ah, little girl, oh, little daughter. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. The crows know about raw stumps. Five. She ran holding the jar and fell, cutting open her chest. The <coughs> scar does not mar her beauty. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. The bite of apple does not corrupt, not the crust of sleep in her eyes. Seven pairs of fingers smudge the glass. She can think in her dream state that she dreams. Six. The caterpillar droppings sound like rain outside her room behind the kitchen where the ashes are gray and gentle. The mice are rats. The mother is dead. The real mother is always dead. As she twirls around, her skirt swirls up. Those rags that smell like foresight. Seven. The mother sews doll dresses from scraps of her own silk and chiffon hems. Even the oldest girl adores dolls. As she twirls around, her gown swirls up. The twelve sisters lift their skirts. The father betrays by being father, the child, the child. So their dancing slippers wear thin each night. In bed, their ecstatic feet pulse with blisters. So um, I made I made up that little form, and um, I liked the way the repetition kept you know, holding things together in different ways. So I uh, returned to that uh, kind of exercise, and um, about a year ago I wrote this. Um, it's a long poem, and it might be my last poem. I mean, for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. <laughs> the ashes. When the puppy snarfles for breakfast, I wake to the radiator gurgling, then feet crunching the reticent snow. Before I was born, mother sewed her own suits. What do her ashes know? Father shoved snow off the supine roof. Mother crafted Christmas ornaments, blue and glitter and red balls, no tinsel, no angels. Her death started in the living room. For bonsai, pliers the size of a nail clipper, spools of wire and a fist-sized rock one bore a petite pomegranate, never to eat, not to touch. Her death began with a baseball bat. In the vineyard, he secured the strongest cane, from training stake to fruiting wire, pruning with handsaw and lopper. He'd leave a spur for the next season. He shoved her away with direct objects. 
In a cold snap, if one pipe freezes, the rest may freeze as well, even before the puppy snarkles, even before a baby sister arrived in the misleading car in mother's arms. After the war, after she met father, she smoked menthols but didn't cha-cha anymore. She'd light up and blow smoke out the apoplectic window. He found the ashes on the sill. Fireflies blinked for mates or prey outside the savvy window of my own first home. On the stereo, a blues man cried, I need my ashes hauled. The dress was too smart to wear. I tucked away our baby's pink layette in circumspect mothballs for a christening that never took place, as well a doll that anti-crocheted. More than anything, I love tidal pools. I know her ashes are at father's, lost in this charnel of junk mail. He claims that thieves have stolen that box, his knob cutter and root hook. He says, remains aren't ashes anyways. Winter stripped everything to the limb and dejected nest. No angels, no crash. I don't know whose recollections are suspect. After leaving Maui, mother learned to swim. She loved tidal pools more than anything. In my kitchen, the logs blink in the fire. Through blinds, the wind blusters and the browbeaten trees creak in the orchard. The rain pours then stops for sun. If he lost mother's ashes, what more could I stand? Omusubi tastes best on black beaches. Since mother never learned to swim, did she watch her five brothers from a blanket? <coughs> on the intransigent subway, I don't know if I've passed my station. His mother said, yes. Iron, I bit my lip again. Mother showed our baby how to sift flour and how to crank an egg beater. After father lost her, he barred everyone from the rooms and the yard where at night long red worms slither from the ground. Her ashes know, before the puppy snarfles, father shoves snow off the supine roof. For bonsai, use pliers the size of a nail clipper. In the vineyard, the strongest canes. In a cold snap, a hair dryer on frozen pipes. Fireflies blinked for mates or prey outside while I tucked away my baby's pink layette. Her ashes know, their box is in the living room, where she didn't cha-cha anymore. Where has winter stripped everything to the nest? In my kitchen, the logs blink in the fire, and I know omusubi tastes best on black beaches. She knew to show her granddaughter how to sift flour. We have a poet who's read in this space a few times before, Sally Wen Mao, um, who's the author of Mad Honey Symposium from Alice James Books. Uh, the book won the 2012 Kenneth Gerstler Award uh, and was a top pick at a number of publications, including Poets and Writers and Publishers Weekly. Uh, her second book, Oculus, is forthcoming from Grey Wolf Press in 2019. Um, Sally's won a number of prizes, including the Pushcart, uh, fellowships from Kundiman, Redloaf, Jerome Foundation, Hedgebrook, and elsewhere. Um, and she's currently the 2016 uh, to 2017 Coleman Center Fellow at the New York Public Library. 
Um, you can see some of her poems, including um, poems that have visuals that are from 16-bit role-playing games um, in our online magazine, The Margins. Let's give her all a hand, Sally. Thank you, Ken, and it's such an honor to be in this space uh, with some of my favorite poets. Um, um, okay, Do, should I put this here? Is that is that the idea? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with a with a poem that I kind of discovered. Uh, this isn't my poem. Um, it's a poem by a f uh, by a photographer who uh, just passed away today. Um, and, and he's the same age as me. He's born in 1987. Um, and uh, he, uh, and, and I, I didn't, I, I looked at his photos and I was so haunted by them today. Um, um, but I, what I didn't realize was that I had seen his work before at a gallery in um, Chinatown. And um, this was, um, this was just a, a single book illuminated on a, on a wooden bench. And I, I read parts of that book. It was uh, poems by this, uh, by this photographer. And his name is Ren, Huan, uh, Ren Han. Um, so I'm, I'm reading one poem by him. I'm lonely. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so this poem is called I'm Lonely. I'm lonely for me and all of you are different. I was born knowing to squat to shit. I already knew the scent of stink. You still need to learn to smell. Still make your mama tell you. That is shit. Don't eat it. Um, I will read one poem from Mad Honey Symposium. And this is the space where I uh, celebrated the release of this. And now it's been three years. So, um, Hai Boon for Thawing. I long for an immigrant in my bed, one who is unafraid of knots, one who will arrive with hail on his eyelash, one whose memories are muddy as mine, one who feels the dirt in his marrow, one who guesses the words of his own father's dialects, one whose skin leaps to touch mine, one who follows the floodlights north to me, one who discovers a hideaway crouching with his palm above his throat where it's warmest. One who trespasses arboretums soaked in manic light. I long to measure his body by its immateriality, its ability to seep through borders. Someone formed from a womb of passage. Together we incubate one sleep, one tick, one uncombed head. Too far from winter, the distance to each face grows. Quiet, said my wish. Um, and I will read um, a couple of really like brand new poems um, um, from this series I've been working on at the library. Um, and, and there's a little bit of like, I guess, a story behind it. Um, so th these poems are set at the Met Gala, or uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I, I don't know if any of you remember the 2015 exhibition, China Through the Looking Glass. Um, so, so essentially that's like a, an exhibition about, ooh, like look at this mystical China and, um, and like let's celebrate all these like Western fantasies of China. Um, so so I, um, I took, uh, their reference uh, through the Looking Glass, Alice, and I uh, and I um, and I kind of did this series of poems, each named after a chapter from Through the Looking Glass, and um, I am Alice in in these poems. I'm entering this wonderland of the Western fantasy of China. Um, so um, this section is called the Garden of Live Flowers. In Lewis Carroll's tome, glass is not a border. In fact, it becomes 
immaterial. A silvery mist you can breathe in. Opacity has a way of tricking us into believing something is impenetrable. Glass becomes gauze, becomes haze, and in that haze, the little girl enters the mirror. The spectacle does what it seeks to do. It makes me forget. As I wander through the halls, I forget who I am. My own body, what I'm wearing, a blue cornflower dress with an empire waist, stitched in a soap factory in China by the hands of a young woman. There are no wild silkworms left in the world. For humans to harvest silk, the silkworm has to die. Cocoons thrown in boiling water. If the silkworm survives and becomes a silk moth, the silk is ruined. Everything beautiful contains in it a kernel, a suggestion of suffering and death. Otherwise, it would just be pretty and uncomplicated. Wisteria surrounds a willow tree, a pagoda and three bridges, all painted Ming blue. All around its branches, the wisteria whispers. The decor comes alive. Their breath makes me wistful. I choke. One by one, memories march. The first time I visited my grandfather's village, the first time I had to leave him, his whole face scorching up. My parents, born during a famine, my whole life marked by 19 degrees of separation. And this section is called Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Lewis Carroll published Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There in 18... 71, the same year as the Chinese massacre in Los Angeles, where 17 Chinese immigrants were robbed, tortured, and hanged by a mob of more than 500 white men in a single alley in what is now downtown near Union Station. It is the largest mass lynching in American history. The, the 1870s, the height of the Gilded Age, when moguls built monuments out of blood sacrifices. 1871, one decade after the Second Opium War. 1871, two years after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. 1871, one decade before the Chinese Exclusion Acts. 1871, 16 years before the Snake River Massacre, which left the bodies of 31 Chinese men dead in a dusky Oregon Valley named Hell's Canyon. In one ranch home, a Chinese skull was fashioned into a decorative sugar bowl. If you decontextualize the history from the bowl and place it on a kitchen table, what do you have? A varnished object whose function is to hold sugar. Sugar sweetened the ranch hands' morning coffee, sweetened the whipping cream, the cakes and tarts, the purpose of sugar, pleasure, sensation, what a treat, skull, sockets, 19th century cane field. If you place the decorative sugar bowl in a museum exhibition, what do you get? An even brighter elevation. When a curator smiles, he gives us permission to enjoy the sugar bowl for pure aesthetic value. And the spectators can sigh in relief, an apolitical, ahistorical fantasy of oohs and ahs. They can, they can judge objectively the sugar bowl's worth. I am sitting in the ground on, in somebody's fantasy in the plundered exhibition hall. Naturally, I'm naked. My body belongs not to me, but all who behold it. Imagine doing something to this, my placard would read. The window portal is solid now. There is no escape. I find myself talking to a lacquered bowl behind a glass display. It is sitting precariously on a wall. I fear it would fall and crack, but it doesn't believe me. It tells me it's unbreakable. What makes you so confident? I ask, envying the bull's assurance. If I break, the king will come and restore me with his army and his knights. It's all but guaranteed that my rights are protected. I'm glad you could have such trust in the system. I'd be a traitor if I didn't, the bull says. And you, Missy, where are you from? 
you don't look like you belong here. Um, okay, so I have a, a couple more poems. Um, uh, one, this poem is uh, from a series about Afa Moy, who is the first Asian American woman to ever come to the U.S. She was uh, she was shipped um, from uh, from Canton um, in, in a boat, and uh, she was publicly displayed in a museum exhibition, a traveling museum exhibition in 1834. Um, and and. And what struck me about this story was that it occurred maybe 10 or 15 years before the gold rush when all the Chinese immigrants started pouring in. Um, and, and she got to visit the president um, at the time. So this section is called the Oval Office, Washington, D.C., 1835. They took me to the Capitol, winter, gray as steel, the White House, with its forlorn arches. Why did they take me here? Give me a coronation, a title, queen of a bastardized empire. Let me quench America's thirst for royalty. I performed a song in Cantonese for the president of the United States of America, Mr. Andrew Jackson. Glory is a strange concept here. No riches, no throne, no robes, no royalty. He seemed polite enough, but he was no emperor. Atun warned me, don't get too confident. Mr. President may look unremarkable, but beneath his skin, lodged near his heart, are bullets never removed from when he murdered a man. This nice man is a slave trader, plantation owner, founder of the Democratic Party, and his nickname, Jackass. Mr. President shook my hand, stared at my feet like other men, begged me to ask my countrymen to change its laws. I sang, I hollered, my whole life in my throat. To the audience, my voice sounded ghastly, my words were inscrutable. The lyrics, if I could remember, how a face conceals its intentions like a woman conceals her name. And this is uh, the last poem. Um, uh, so this, this poem is called Inauguration Poem. I wrote it um, after the inauguration. And I, uh, I, d I decided to use uh, the words that were in that horrible inauguration speech. Um, <laughs> Like in in each of uh, oh no like in, in in at the end of these lines so um so yeah this poem is called inauguration poem thank you all for being here um a girl stalked a sheep in a field the sheep began to bleed and the whole field smelled like carnage a butcher had moved in and slaughtered the sheep. Read the stain on her dress, empty her basket, the depletion of resources winter sowed, the house on the hill in disrepair. In the vacated house, the girl tries to flush the blood down the toilet, but the infrastructure couldn't completely erase the evidence of life. The girl studied Islamic history, the origin of arithmetic. The stain turned the girl into a lady in her country's blighted first world landscape. History's pages were open, one by one they ripped. When she asked the spout for water, it rusted. She grew cold, she grew weary, she grew sad. If only she could ban the butcher in solidarity with the bad children, the refugees, and outcasts. Instead, she drove into the city, the urban sprawl swallowing her. She went into a store, got caught stealing a candy bar. Surveillance footage showed she had no remorse. She justified, we all live on stolen land. Why not one bar of chocolate subsidized? 
Then she remembered prisoners, their tombstones unmarked. A cop arrested her, trapped her in the back of the police van. Trillions of atoms spinning inside her body, an unrealized commodity for strange men's agendas. Order, dystopia, blueprint of urban catastrophe. The streets without strangers, all barren. The trees without protection, all windswept. Thank you. We're gonna try the mic stand one more time. Um, while that's being set up, um, I'm excited to have uh, with us tonight, Emily Yoon, um, who is the poetry editor for our magazine, The Margins, and was a former intern here. Um, uh, and it's our honor to have her to read here tonight. Um, to give you some background about her, uh, she's currently a PhD student at the University of Chicago, studying um, East Asian languages and civilizations. Um, she received her MFA here at NYU, and I, I think we have some NYU people here. Anyone? NYU pride? No. <laughs> um, and uh, when she was there, she was one of the editors of the Washington Square Review, and she's uh, been interviewed by them online, I believe. And she was a Star Wars fellow. Um, and uh, she has poems upcoming in a number of places, including poetry in The New Yorker, where I believe she was uh, today recording um, her poem online. So uh, let's do this mic stand business and then give a hand to... <coughs> I also want to raise the podium a little. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. That's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, this is great. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Ken said, I was an intern here in 2014, and actually um, the first event that I helped organize was Kathy Lynch Hay and Sally's book launch party, and that was, I think, the first time I met Sally, um, who has become um, a dear friend. So I'm really excited to share a space with Sally and Kimiko, who is my thesis advisor, the most generous and fun <coughs> thesis advisor a girl could ask for. And of course, Monica Yoon, whom I've been dying to meet because she's a genius. And um, they're all goddesses. And um, I'm like trembling. Oh. I'm glad you find that endearing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Ken and Jyothi, for being so nice to me for three years and um, offering up this space. Um, okay, I'm done with my Grammy <laughs> award speech. So. <laughs> An ordinary misfortune. What is pressing? What is pressed? Or who? My grandmother, a woman, a teen. Her father presses the gate shut, presses her into a crate, the crate into a shed. She unfolds by morning, binds her chest. She walks on woman. An American soldier sees her and yells, stop over there, in Japanese, the language they've both learned. When she runs, she is unmistakably woman. She falls. He laughs. What is a body in a stolen country? Or whose? What is right in war? What is left in war? War hasn't left Korea. I have. I fold. I give up myself to you. Which one of you said, let's have raunchy Korean sex to me? Which one of you didn't? Do you represent America to me? Did those soldiers to her? We didn't fear war. We feared the Allies, she said. Mm. Let's have raunchy Korean sex was actually something that someone said to me like <laughs> over Facebook. Um, 
We're not friends on Facebook anymore. Um, <laughs> but his name was Patrick. <laughs> like the whitest name. <laughs> Is there Patrick here? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to read a New York poem. Um, I was in K-Town, obviously, and <laughs> this um, person was trying to catcall, I guess, and um, he strung together some Korean words that he had picked up, and it ended up being, Hello, Miss Pretty Bitch. <laughs> so the poem is titled that. Hello, Miss Pretty Bitch. The street drummer calls out in Korean, no doubt thinking it a compliment, a pleasant surprise, cinched with red ribbons for Christmas, the day select theaters will gift us with the interview, a comedy in which two American journalists ignite Kim Jong-un's face. Freedom has prevailed, the film star Seth Rogen says about the release. The same was thought at the time of Korea's release from the Japanese Empire. Though then the Korean War began and compared to war, what's so bad about a movie? Anyway, even war can be funny. And now a drummer in New York says, you got a smile that could light up the whole town. Though I'm not smiling, thinking about villages and cities of what became North Korea set on fire, sending puddles of twilight into sunless skies as if flames could stab. But his freedom of speech prevails. Freedom always prevails, which is why we get to see two Americans incinerate a Korean face on Christmas, hold our popcorn and chocolate bars, and laugh as the dictator explodes in tune to a pop song. Laugh as American soldiers would laugh at Korean children chanting Hello, hello, give me chocolate with wartime hunger. Laugh as they choose which face to light up. Um, I have a couple of poems uh, from a long poem called Testimonies, and they're um, poems um, made out of testimonies by real uh, former comfort women of Korea, uh, the sex slaves of the Japanese empire. Um, I'll read a couple of them. This is from Hwang Geum-ju's testimony. A draft notice for girls. Who was going to go? Everybody. Crying. I went. I dressed nicely and went. Train. Windows covered with tar paper. None of the girls knew. Japanese soldiers on horses. Fast Manchurian field. It was now much too cold to sleep. Thanks to our body warmth, the sun rose. I waited for them to send me to a factory. They could not possibly dump me here. I was called Haruko Naragaki. My long hair was still braided. An officer told me that there were five orders to obey. If I missed any, I would be less than dead. I hoped one of the orders was for me to work at a factory. I looked at his jacket, hung inside out, to hide his name. I looked at my virgin's braid, at his knife, and he told me I was not going to any factory, told me to take off my clothes. I told him I did not understand his order and his kind of factory. And he laughed. Girls arrived, got sick, pregnant, injected with so many drugs, nameless animals exploded on top of us. The day of liberation, suddenly, no sound of horses. The last soldier stood in the kitchen and said, your country is liberated and my country is sitting on a fire. So I left the barracks, I walked. I was alone and walked all the way to the 38th parallel. American soldiers sprayed me with so much DDT, all the lice fell off me. It was December 2nd. I lost my uterus. I am now 73 years old. Um, 
Am I breathing too much into it? Oh my God. Um, there was a man about 45 years of age with a mustache who told me to work for Japan and meet my brother in Hiroshima. The man said my refusal might not be good for my parents. The man and his men took me to Shimonoseki. I was led into a room. I was told to take a bath. I was told to take off my clothes. I only begged that I meet my brother. When they finally took me to Hiroshima, my brother was alone in a big empty room. He asked if I came as a comfort woman, and I promised I would return to see him again. When flower buds were about to appear, I was taken to Osaka. In its room, I was number 10. I was then a comfort woman. I became so sick with cephalus, I could not walk. One night, an officer came and told me to get ready. I was in such great pain. The next thing I remember is arriving in Seoul. It was June 1945. Immediately, I had a miscarriage. The mustache man learned of my return, told me to return to the comfort station. To avoid the draft again, I got married. Our new life, a rented room. I could smell the odor of my weekly number 606, arsenic for syphilis. My baby discharged pus from his ears, was called crazy. My brother returned home with burns and lumps all over his body from radiation, discharged disintegrated bone the size of teeth near his wounds, and the Japanese soldiers discharged, discharge, out of charge into every room. Now I'll read some more recent, recent work. So there was an earthquake in uh, last September in Korea, and no one got really seriously hurt, but as Korea is not a very earthquake-prone country, everyone like really freaked out, and um, there was a national panic, and I was actually there, and I felt the ground move, and it was the first time I actually really felt um, a sizable earthquake, but I wrote a poem right after that, so... On the day of the Gyeongju earthquake, September 12, 2016. All I want to think about is love and gratitude on the escalator in Busan station, having put you on the train back to Seoul, avoiding the eyes of the doomsayer on the staircase next to my descending steps as he screams death upon those who don't accept God. The end is coming, so come to church or the earth will split open to swallow you and you won't be saved. He spits a different miracle on each face. God slits the sea down the woman behind me. Flame bursts into the world and water fills it, then overflows. It is not that I don't fear water and fire. It is not that I don't believe in God. We already kill and die with water and fire. An ocean away, the police will shoot Terence Crutcher and Keith Lamont Scott, and it will not be the end. And here, Peng Namgi will die from a water cannon, and none of this was for not believing in the right power, which is God. The doomsayer says, we must surrender, and he is sure of this. Across the station, windows of love motels light up, then dim, as lovers enter the room, empty for, empty into each other. The end of summer is coming. I have now walked far away from the man. It is not that I don't believe in God. For once, all I want is to think about love and gratitude. Thank God for all our lives. When the earth begins to tremble, I look back to the station, already emptied of your train. No one will die from this. Not today. Not today. But people embrace, touch each other by the wrist, by instinct. The man stands alone, like me, 
his arms lifted, perhaps in surrender, perhaps in gratitude. Oh my God, I'm sweating so much. Okay. There are three more poems. Time in Wales. Our legs of yellow skin next to one another, calves spread. I think of beached whales, the arcs of their bellies, clean and gleaming. A whale would lie in the shape of something cold, the body sipping on itself like a drain. Gravity sucks a whole whale onto sand. You study Korean, whispering, Muroruda, Muroruda, meaning literally water rises, but really meaning to improve or to rise and sap in springtime trees. Come spring, it will be your birthday. We will have seaweed soup, supply our blood with oxygen. Do you know that Koreans do that because hundreds of years past they saw whales eating seaweed after giving birth? You cross your legs, their hair black and coarse like my father's and my grandfather's across the ocean and do you know that whales have hair, perhaps a sign of their past when they walk the earth? Summer of years past, your father across the same ocean to bring you to America, where you would grow up speaking a language different from mine. Do you know that whales, too, detect where one another comes from through song? That music I hear is yours and ours. Mororuda, mororuda, water rises. Whales die in this year's hot winter. Your father has told you of the summer, the dank heat. Your foster mother ran after you, you already asleep in your father's arms, wailing your name. You will not be called by that name the next day, and years will pass by. But when you're 10, you will write about that story and spell whale as the animal whose breath is a distance, spouting steam the great animal that becomes crushed by air and sprayed with words, man's fault. And yes, so perhaps the world will end in water, taking with it all loving things. And yes, in grace, only song, only buoyancy. You rise now, whispering, murolida, murolida, meaning, literally, to raise water, but really meaning, to bring water to a boil. How am I doing with time? Do I can I read two poems or? Okay. Everyone's like yawning. Um, Bell theory. <clears throat> when I was laughed at for my clumsy English, I touched my throat, which said ear. When my ear said ear. And year after year, I pronounced a new thing wrong, and other throats laughed. Elevator, library, vibrating bells in their mouths. How to say azalea, how to say forsythia. Say instead golden bells, say I'm in ESL. In French class, a boy whose last name is Kring called me Bell, called me by my Korean name, pronouncing it wrong, called it loudly called attention to my alien. I touched the globe moving in my throat, a hemisphere sinking. Called me across the field lined with golden bells. I wanted to run and be loved at the same time, by Kring, as in ring of people. Where are you going? We're laughing with you. The bell in our throat that rings with laughter is called uvula, from uva, grape. A theory, special to our species, this grape bell has to do with speech, which separates us from animals. Kring looked at me and said, just curious, do you eat dogs? And I wanted to end my small life, be reborn a golden retriever of North America, lie on a field lined with golden bells, loved. Today, in a country where dogs are more cherished than a foreign child, an Oregon Senate candidate says no to refugees, says, Years ago, Vietnamese refugees ate dogs, harvested other people's pets, 
Harvest, as in harvest grapes. Harvest, as in harvest a field of golden rice. As do people from rice countries. As in people eat dog worlds. Years ago, 1923, Japan, the phrase Jugo en Gojitsen is used to set apart Koreans, say 15 yen, 50 sen. The colonized who used the chaos of the Kanto earthquake to poison waters set fire, a cruelty special to our species. A cruelty special to our species. How to say Jugo, how to say Gojit, how Jugo sounds like die in Korean, how Gojit sounds like lie, lie, lie. Library, azalea, library. I'm going to the library. I lied years ago on a field lined with forsythia. Um, my last poem is a brand new poem that I wrote just like last week. Um, it's titled Mercy, but I feel like it's not doing enough work, so if you're good with titles, you can whisper it to me later. In my country, our shamans were women and our gods multiple until white people brought an ecstasy of rosaries and our cities today glow with crosses like graveyards. As a child in Sunday school, I was told I'd go to hell if I didn't believe in God. Our teacher was a woman whose daughters wanted to be nuns and I asked, what about babies and what about Buddha? And she said, they're in hell too. <laughs> And so I memorized prayers and recited them in front of women I did not believe in. Deliver us from evil, O sweet Virgin Mary, amen. O sweet, O sweet. In this country, which calls itself Christian, what is sweeter than hearing, have mercy on us from those who serve different gods? O clement, O loving, O God, O God amidst ruins, amidst waters, fleeing, fleeing, deliver us from evil. Oh sweet, oh sweet. In this country, point at the moon, at the stars, point at the way the lake lies and with a handful of feathers, and they will look at the feathers and kill you for it. If a word for religion they don't believe in is magic, so be it. Let us have magic. Let us have our own mothers and scarves, our spirits, our shamans, and our sacred books. Let us keep our stars to ourselves, and we shall pray to no one. Let us eat what makes us holy. I can confirm these lights make you very sweaty. Um, thank you, Emily. Next, we have Monica Yoon, whose most recent book, Black Acre, which is available for sale back there, was long listed for the National Book Award and shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Penn Open Book <coughs> Award. Um, she's the author of two other books of poetry, including Barter from Grey Wolf and Ignaz, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her poems have appeared in a number of places, including The New Yorker, The Paris Review, The New York Times Magazine, and she's been named, she's been awarded fellowships in the Library of Congress, Stanford University, and elsewhere. She currently teaches poetry at Princeton, and she's on the board of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. It's always so great to be here. I mean, it just feels like home, you know, and it's particularly wonderful to read with this group of uh, stellar poets and stellar woman. I have been looking forward to this for such a long time. So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start with some poems from Blackacre. So Blackacre uh, is a legal term. It's like you say John Doe for a hypothetical person. You say Blackacre for a hypothetical piece of land. Ken knows this. Uh, 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 he's a, a lapsed lawyer like me. Um, and I was using that in this book for a number of things. Maybe I'll start with this um, with this one, um, I, we were at a uh, colleague asked uh, a number of us who were new parents to write a poem during our baby's nap time, 
And, um, you know, my baby it was born within 10 days of Ken's babies, and, and Ken's baby, and as he knows, uh, this was uh, during uh, a lot of the protests uh, for Black Lives Matter, and I live very close to Foley Square in Manhattan, um, and so during my baby's nap time, I had the white noise machine going, and the white noise machine was drowning out the helicopters and the sirens and the chants. And I was thinking about white noise and the way it's the same sound wave repeated over and over and over. And I thought how early we are taught that to surround oneself with sameness is somehow comforting. So the epigraph is from um, the white noise app that we have downloaded. Um, you probably, white acre. You probably have noticed if you're in a brightly lit room filled with white light, it is difficult to see colored lights. That's because those individual colors get masked by surrounding white light. In the same way, other sounds will get masked by white noise, so they become less detectable. Proleptic flinch of whiteness, the hunch of shouldering into it, stoic glitch zipping up its jacket of static knit fabric of interlocking Zs. The apotropaic as abject self-replicating reflex of self-defense, vain camouflage that functions as neither shield nor shelter. The canker's milk nourishes nothing. The ice rink exudes only its own doom. Um, this is Brown Acre. Um, after the clear plastic sheeting has been pulled back, folded away, after each woody rhizome has been pried loose from the soil, each snarl of roots traced to its capillary ends, twigs and pebbles tossed aside, worms reburied elsewhere. After the soil has been rubbed through a sieve, after the ground has been leveled with rakes and stakes and string, no need for further labor, further motion. Nothing has been sown. Nothing is germinating in the raw dirt. The light strikes each granule the same as any other. A windlessness rises, becomes a precondition. Why is it hard to admit you couldn't live here? No one could live here. This is not the texture of the real, lacking attachment, lacking event. This is neither landscape nor memory. This is parable, a caricature of restraint. But why does this shame you? Even now, you're trying to hide that your gaze is drifting upward. This plainness cannot hold your attention. You're searching the sky for some marker of time, of change. In a cloudless sky, the sun beats down. But if you observe that the sun warms the soil, you must also concede that the soil will grow colder. The sun stains only the body. And the body is what is simply not at issue here. Um, this next one was written after oh, a little controversy around the best American poetry in 2015 that some of you might remember. Um, and I wrote it, there's this, uh, you know, there's obviously the epithet Twinkie, and, um, and uh, there's an urban legend in my junior high school, which was that Twinkies uh, weren't actually baked. They were kind of this goo that was extruded and then exposed to a chemical, so they foamed up and they kind of grew this golden layer outside of the you know creamy inner layer. And you know, so this is what I believed. Um, and um, it turns out, unfortunately, this wasn't true. I think something else worth saying about this is written in the subjunctive. The subjunctive in English is the mode which we use to express fantasy or unreality. And what's interesting is in English is often indistinguishable from the past so that, you know, you say you are or as if you were, right? Or, um, and I was thinking about the way in which fantasy and particularly racist fantasy likes to cloak itself in the language of the past, you know, uh, gone with the wind, Aryanism, uh, make America great again, you know, what value is added by that again? Um, Goldacre. As if you were ever wide-eyed enough to believe in urban legends, as if these plot elements weren't the stalest of cliches, the secret lab, the anaerobic chamber, the gloved hand ex machina, the chemical-infused fog. As if every origin story didn't center on the same sweet myth of a lost wholeness, as if such longing would seem more palatable if packaged as nostalgia. 
as if there once had been a moment of unity, smoothly numinous, pellucid, as if inner and outer were merely phases of the same substance, as if this whiteness had been your original condition, as if it hadn't been what was piped into you, what seeped into each vacant cell, each air hole, each pore, as if you had started out skinless, shameless, blameless, creamy as if whipped, passive as if extruded, quivering with volatility in a metal mold, as if a catalyzing vapor triggered a latent reaction, as if your flesh foamed up a hydrogenated emulsion consisting mostly of trapped air, as if, though sponge-like, you could remain shelf-stable for decades, <laughs> part embalming fluid, part rocket fuel, part glue, as if you had been named twin, a word for likeness, or wink, a word for joke, or ink, a word for stain, or key, a word for answer. As if your skin oxidized to its present burnished hue, golden, as if homemade. And then this one, so a lot of the, um, the book is about infertility, and particularly about the experience of shame that... Uh, surrounds infertility and trying to trace the roots of that shame, how it's you know embedded in our culture and our system of property. Um, and um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about were the stories we tell our little girls. You know, the things that we buy them, the dolls, the baby carriages, um, and um, and you know how we teach them what is valuable in a woman. And in particular, I was thinking about the book Peter Pan, where if you've ever read the original Peter and Wendy, it's a very strange and a very beautiful and a weirdly sinister book. Um, there's this one episode that really haunted me where the Lost Boys, these little boys, they, they want Wendy desperately to come, um, this little girl, uh, to Neverland and to stay there and to be their mother, to commit to that. And, um, and so they build this house for her, and it's explained that, you know, what they had lying around were these vines that oozed the sticky red sap, so they build this, like, <laughs> sticky, veiny, red, oozing house um, for the little girl. I'm like, wow, subtle. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and so the epigraph here is from Peter and Wendy. Um, of course, Slightly was the first to get his word in. Wendy, lady, he said rapidly, for you we built this house. Oh, say your please, cried Nibs. Lovely, darling house, Wendy said, and they were the very words they had hoped she would say. And we are your children, cried the twins. Then all went on their knees and holding out their arms cried, Oh, Wendy, lady, be our mother. Ought I, Wendy said, all shining. Of course, it's frightfully fascinating, but you see, I am only a little girl. I have no real experience. Redacre. In a scheme to entice her, they fashioned a shrine with jewel work of berries, with cruel work of vines, red mullions flaunting flocked velvet drapes, rose-patterned carpets in plush-piled heaps. At the pulsating heart of this upholstered nest, a snug seat like a socket that whispered of rest. But I can't be your mother, I'm not ready yet. And the eaves of the little home slumped with regret, and its sorrow turned inward, turned acid, turned foul, and corrosion traced stencils in slime on the wall, and the draperies puddled in ponds on the floor, and the overripe cushions ruptured like sores. The seat melted to nothing, a hollowed out void drained away everything in a purgative flood, more taboo than urine, an fluvial flow streamed toward the sewers, a liquefied no. Wide-eyed and wide-mouthed, she gaped in dismay as pearl-like the possibles went floating away. Uh, and the last one I'll read from this book is um, one of the two title poems. Um, this one is it based on a sonogram. Um, I, you know, we eventually had an egg donor uh, baby, but, uh, but this was a sonogram of what seems to have been my last viable egg. Black Acre. One day they showed me a dark moon ringed with a bright nimbus on a swirling gray screen. They called it my last chance for never-ending life. But the next day it was gone. It had already launched itself into the gray sky 
like an escape capsule, accidentally empty, sits spiraling into the unpeopled galaxies of my trackless gray body. And then I'll end with this. Uh, this is a poem I wo wrote, uh, was asked to write in the wake of the, uh, in the, wake of the election. Uh, it's based on four definitions of the word mine. Uh, and each section begins with a, a definition. A guide to usage, mine, a, pronoun, my, belonging to me. How should I define the limits of my concern, the boundary between mine and not mine, the chime of the pronoun like a steel ring cast over what I know, what I name, what I claim, what I own. The wine of the pronoun hones its edges to keenness because there is power in the categorical that prides itself and plumps itself and proliferates till there is no room in here for anything but power, till there is no air in here but there would be no need for air if you could learn to breathe in whatever I breathe out. B. Noun one. A pit or tunnel in the earth from which precious stones or ores or coal are taken by digging or by other methods. Because the earth does not gleam with the shine of the noun, to dig into the earth is imperative. To use my fingers or else to fashion more rigid, more perjurable fingers that cut or delve or sift or shatter. Because we are more evolved than animals. Because to mine is not to burrow. Because the earth is not for us to live in. Because the earth is not precious in itself. The earth is that from which what is precious is taken. What is scraped away or blasted away or melted away from what my steel-tipped fingers can display or sell or burn. C. Noun 2. A device intended to explode when stepped upon or touched or when approached by a ship, vehicle, or person. My devise, my device redefined by intent, so thin-skinned, this earth is untouchable. A sly simulacrum of innocence, concealing an infinity of hair-trigger malice. The cry of the noun sealed in a concentric sphere that sheaths its lethal secret in silence. Unapproachable, it sings its unspeakable harvest in this field I have seeded with violence. D. Verb. To dig away or otherwise remove the substratum or foundation of. To sap, to ruin by slow degrees or secret means. To dig is to build dark dwellings of negative space to knit a linked network of nothing. The seams of the seemingly solid unravel, the itch of erosion, the scratch of collapse, each absence the artifact of specific intention, an abscess, a crater, a honeycomb of dead husks. The home of the verb is founded on ruin. The crime of the verb hollows out prisons and graves. The rhyme of the verb tunnels from fissure to fracture, from factory to faction, from fault line to fate. This foundation is equal parts atom and emptiness. This fear invades fractally by rhizome and root. What cement could salvage this crumbling concrete should I pledge my allegiance to unearthing or earth? That was an amazing series of readings. Um, let's uh, give a hand to all four of our readers. Monica, Monica, Sally, Emily. Um, we have books for sale in the back, and we also have um, really high quality wine from Trader Joe's. So please stick around, get your books autographed, tell the writers how amazing they are. Let's give them another hand.